Not for a minute was I forsaken. I love that part of the song. You know, when I first heard that song, it really stood out to me, the portion in there that during the chorus, I'm not enough unless you come. How many of you have been in a place where you've not felt like enough? Yeah, that part of the song, ugh, it's weighty because it hits us right where we are and who we are. Um, Lord, I'm not enough unless, unless you're here. It's just biblical, great theology point. For without Christ, we are nothing. You know, in Christ, I can do all things, but without him, I'm not enough unless you come. And I used to listen to that song, but this morning as I was just worshiping in the 830 service and, and the worship team was just killing that song and, and it's as if God just shook me in the midst of that chorus because I'm singing that part like it's my testimony. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? And then I get to the second line. Because all I want and God stopped me and said, am I all you want? Or is there a bunch of other stuff wrapped around what you want and I'm in the mix? Because all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? It's a request and it's a, it's a, it's a weighty request, church. So I hope you enjoyed the song, but I hope you prayed the song, that, that chorus that says, God, I don't want anything. All I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? That's when, that's when true breakthrough, that's when true healing, that's when true worship, praise, and those things begin to really land is when all we want is who God is in us. And that's enough for us. Uh, we are in week two of a series called Rooms. And last week we, we talked about a room where a, a lame man was dropped through the roof and Jesus healed them and there were some people there that carried the mat there was a guy that was on the mat and then there were some people that got in the way I hope this week that you carried a mat for somebody you got them you got them to church you got them to Jesus you introduced them some way shape or form to Christ that was the room we were in this last week this week's a little different in that we're going to actually go into a room that Jesus commands us to go into and we only see Jesus tell the disciples to go into a couple rooms in the gospels there's only actually two one of which we're going to talk about today in Matthew chapter 6. The other one is the upper room where he says, go into a room that will be prepared and go prepare this, this last supper. And so it's fitting that we're doing communion today also in this series called Rooms. But as, as we get to this idea, I want to talk to you today about prayer. How many of you would say you're good at prayer? Say amen. Yes, what I figured. How many of you know you could work on it? Say Amen. I'm not going to ask the next question would be, how many of you don't do it at all? Okay. I think we're good at prayer at moments, aren't we? Like, our prayer can get real serious if we're in trouble. Anybody ever been in trouble and then your prayer life all of a sudden become like saintly? <laughs> like, I, there... <laughs> There have been moments in my life when, when I have prayed fervently, but it was for my hide, not my soul. Uh, uh, can I get an amen from anybody on that? Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely understand what I call panic prayer. Panic prayer happens if you're driving and blue lights come up in your rearview mirror. <laughs> then you like become the greatest evangelist in the world, right? You're like, dear Jesus, just bless his soul and his family. Lord, anoint them with wealth and riches and let him know it came from me. Uh, you, I mean God, but let him let me off because of you, Jesus. Amen. We're gripping the steering wheel. I hope that worked. Hadn't talked to God in months, but I hope that one went through. How many of you have had to pray to God in regards to your, kid, your kids? Yeah. Dear Jesus, let me not kill them today. How many of you, that's not the prayer you were thinking of? <laughs> like two parents are like, no, I would never pray that. Yeah, you will. 
<laughs> yeah, it's coming, all right? You're still carrying it like this if you said that. Wait till they get about this big and start eating things that aren't edible. <laughs> then you'll be praying, Lord, in Jesus' name, <laughs> deliver me today. Now, kids are fantastic. I think everybody should have dozens, okay? I'm not lying about that. You can talk to me later if you want to. Uh, but prayer is something that I think that as Christians we know about. We're getting ready to dive in in life groups. How many of you are pumped about life group launch tonight? Woo! Yeah, if you are not, from, if you are not signed up for a life group, um, you are living in sin currently. And um, you should really pray about it, all right? I'll get more to the proof of that later in the sermon, but... Uh, no, I think, I think everybody should be in a life group. I, as much as I'm honored, I am not enough. This, Sundays are not enough for you. They're not enough for me uh, to, get in, to get through the week that, that we've had or the, the, the culture that we are currently living in. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And everybody, I've heard a lot of preachers use that for an attendance verse. That means people should come to church. No, it means people should be the church, which means you should be together with other people in the church. Okay? Now, do I want you in church? You bet. Sure thing. I'd love to be here with you because I get refilled and refueled by you being in service with me. I hope you get the same thing. But it's not enough. You need to be in a life group, all right? We're going to walk through some of that here in a little while. But today in this idea of prayer, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 is a very popular scripture because in Matthew chapter 6, we get these very familiar words. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We get that entire Lord's Prayer there. I'm not going to preach that because we're going to spend the next eight weeks, nine weeks in life groups chopping that thing down. And each week taking a portion of that prayer and really diving into what it means and what it truly means to be praying the way God intended us to pray. What I want to do is I want to spend some time in the verses above it. This is where Jesus is setting the table for how to pray. How to pray. And so that's where I want to kind of lean into today. So I hope that you'll go with me today. I pray that you've been blessed already. I hope that God does amazing things in your home and with your family. I pray for healing and health for everybody that you're attached to or close to. And I pray that today the Spirit of God would speak to your heart in a way and move you. So, Pastor Bentz, I don't know if I want to be moved. Well, then I'm going to pray extra hard for you. And I'm going to pray that God rattle your cage. Because it's where growth comes is when we're uncomfortable. C.S. Lewis has a quote where he talked about, he said, if comfort is your goal, Christianity is not your belief. It's a powerful quote because so many people expect that, that I've got Jesus now, it's all good. You got Jesus and so there is a world of hell coming against you. I don't say that to discourage you because I've read the book, we win. I win at the end of it. One day Jesus is coming back and I get to go home and it's going to be awesome. I get to sing with, with the host of angels and my mom and others that have gone on before. Like Hebrews tells us, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. I can't wait to go there. But until I go there, I got a life to live here. And there's no promise in Scripture anywhere that it's going to be comfortable. In fact, throughout Scripture, he kind of goes, it's not going to be comfortable. They're actually going to come against you. Jesus, one of his quotes that they don't put on coffee mugs is, Know ye not that they will come against you, and this word that I bring will bring division. That doesn't really sell well in a calendar. <laughs> Ooh, March. <laughs> it's the division month. No, that's not what, nobody wants to read that one, but it's there. And so I pray today that we can encourage you a little bit with prayer, maybe teach some stuff about prayer. So Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 5, it says, And when you pray, church say, when you pray, pray. you must not be like the hypocrites. I'll keep reading, although I could preach that verse, that portion of the verse for a while. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, church, say when you pray. pray. Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret 
will reward you. Verse 7, and when you pray, church, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask it. Let's pray together. Father, Lord, I come to you and I thank you. I thank you for this opportunity, God, that I get. And Lord, I pray I never take it for granted that you, you give me this opportunity to stand before your people and those that don't know you yet and share who you are, share your word, God, share your challenge, share your spirit. You allow me to do that, God, and I'm, I'm so thankful, so honored. God, I thank you for each person that's walked in this room, whether, whether they were forced to be here, walked in willingly, God, or are confused at where they're even at. Whatever the reason, I'm thankful that they're here, and I pray that they would understand it's not on accident, that this was a moment that you saw, and Lord, I pray that you give me the words to speak for that moment. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Again, as I said earlier, we, I think, are good at prayer at certain times. But I want to kind of lean in on this first point to talk through the importance in the, uh, of understanding that prayer for you and I, if you're here and you're a believer this morning, if you're a believer, say amen. amen. If you're here and you're a believer this morning, then there's something about prayer you should understand. Prayer should not be optional. It's not optional. It's not something that we can kind of do. It's not something that we, you know, if, if we get stressed out or we get a little worried or, or start to panic or whatever it is, that's when we pray. No, it's not an option. You look at Jesus as he's telling this to his followers, the people following Christ. He doesn't say, if you pray. He doesn't say, and in, in when you get a chance to pray, he says, when you pray. I read you three verses, and all three verses start with the same phrase. When you pray, but when you pray, and when you pray. In other words, there's no option for there to not be prayer in your life. Christians, there's no option for there to not be prayer in your life. Well, I'm just not feeling it today. Tough. Prayer is not about feeling. You all know that, right? Now, I'm not saying your emotions are bad. I like emotions. I am a... I am a feeling dude, okay? I cry about over anything. No joke. Like I cry over TV commercials. I cry over when I see a kid and a parent. This morning, Miss Leah was out here putting out communion cups, and Kendra was walking behind her, had the little flashlight holding the light on her so her mama could put the communion cups out. I'm sitting over here with Aaron going, that's a good picture. <laughs> Little girl holding the light, putting out communion. It's so sweet. I go back to my office. I'm like, pull it together, Vince. And I'm an emotional guy. So I have no problem with your emotions being a part of it. But we don't pray because we feel like praying. We pray because there is a God who has an answer. And it's not optional for us. We don't, we don't pray because I'm in the moment. There is no moment. This is this time where we go, God, I need you, and I need an answer from you, and I am your child calling out to you. Prayer is not optional for us as believers. It shouldn't be the last resort. It should be the first thing that we always do. Oh, we've got a decision coming up. We should go to the Lord in prayer about that. Now, please understand, this is not me preaching to you. This is God telling me some of this stuff in my life. Because, look, how many of you know that when you get a little bit of smarts in your life, you stop asking God as much questions? <laughs> You're liars. You're not raising your hand. You're leaving me hanging up here. I don't, I, the moment I think I know something, I figure God has allowed me to move on from his counsel. Any takers on that? Some of you right now, you're like, hey, we're doing good. When's the last time you asked God how you should love your spouse? Well, I'm pretty sure they love me back already. That's not what I said to pray. I said, when's the last time you asked God how you should love your spouse? Well, I don't know that I've ever prayed that. Then you need to talk to him more. I've got six kids. I should be pretty good at this parenting thing. You know. I was talking with John and his wife this morning. 
And they have three little ones, five, four, and one. And they're like, they're talking about having a fourth one. I'm like, hey, you reached the magic number. Once you're outnumbered, you learn to play zone defense and not man to man. <laughs> and once you have three, I'll tell you, people that, under, how many of you have more than three children right now in your house? So you all that have just raised your hand, you understand. Once you have three, bring it on. <laughs> bring on dozens. I can handle it. Why? Because that third one typically comes from the devil. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, they really don't. <laughs> they, they don't. I mean, but some days you think they do. <laughs> Am I close on that, Jamie? All right, yeah. Jeremy's up here having revival, so he understands. No, he, we, we have kids, and we, we see these things happen. We see how there are moments that we, we go to God. You, if you have kids, you understand that there's things they're going to need to ask you. There's things, and it's not an option for, but for them to ask you. But we get smarter as we get older, and we lose that, that knowledge that, no, 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 this isn't something I should just be winging. I need to go ask. I need to go check in. I need to go make sure this is where God would have me to go. And I understand he put gray matter between your ears. He gave you brains. He gave you self, you know, he gave you the intelligence and those type of things. But all of those things are only valuable if they're used through the filter of the Holy Spirit. It's the only time they really become valuable. And so prayer becomes, it's not an option for you and I to think, well, maybe I should pray more about it. Here, here's what I find in the church a lot of times. I love that God sits here with the disciples. He's like, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray, as if there's never a time they're not praying. It's like, no, no, no. I'm not going to spend time telling you to do what you ought to be doing. I'm instead going to equip you for how to do what you should be doing better. I wonder where the church would be if we as teachers, leaders, preachers, pastors, Christians, followers, spent less time reminding ourselves to do the things we know we ought to do and equipped ourselves to do those things better. But sometimes we don't. Sometimes we just get the same lesson. You should pray. Oh, I know I should pray. If you know you should pray, it shouldn't take a sermon or a song or a verse to remind you you should pray. You should be praying. And that's how Jesus approaches it. He says, I'm not going to challenge you to pray. You should already be praying. What I am going to do is equip you to do it better. Equip you to say the right things, to come to the throne in the right way, because that's where the shift happens. And so we see the next part of this is, the first part is that prayer is not optional. It should not be optional for you and I as believers. Second thing we see is that prayer should be intentional. Intentional prayer is pretty incredible. So Brinley is four years old right now, and so at four years old, she's in daycare, and she is just about that age where she's going to be going to kindergarten next year, and Brinley, at this point in her life, knows everything, okay? Anybody have some of those? So Brinley wants to pray all the time at, at dinner or whatever. We pray at dinner, so we're sitting down, we pray. Brinley's like, I pray, and I'm like, all right, you want to pray. Well, not, but see, Brinley's been taught that there's a process to prayer. At four years old, at the daycare, they do this thing where they get, every, they get the kids settled and they get them kind of quiet and they get them to where they're going to pray. And they do these hand motions things. So Brindley starts this thing where she goes, open, shut, and open, shut. And I don't know the rest of it, but she, she says, okay, hands up, hands down, here we go. She closes her hands, bows her head, and peeks out the top of her eye like you guys do when I say every head bowed and every eye closed. Somebody was just like, oh, snap, he sees us. <laughs> yes, I do. Okay. And she gets to pray. Dear God, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food. And then she turns Pentecostal. <laughs> for several minutes, I don't understand a thing that she says. And then she kind of gets quiet. She looks around at everybody at the table. And usually one of us, whether it be her brothers, myself, or Jay, or, or Trista, or somebody at the table goes, and thank you for the food. And thank you for the food. Amen. Amen. And she gets done, and now we can eat. 
I appreciate it because in that middle section that I don't understand, it's never the same. Intentional prayer is never the same. Prayer that you stopped, thought through. Prayer that was valuable. I'm not saying you can't have some prayers that you appreciate. I've I've read some prayers this last week that were so challenging to me that I thought, I'm going to use that. I'm going to remind myself of that prayer. But if prayer is flippant to you, Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? That just that flippant prayer. Oh, yeah, we got a prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for the day. Thank you for the food. In Jesus' name, amen. What did you just do? You didn't talk to God. Well, I prayed. No, 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 no. Look, if I said, Jeremy, I need you to go with me, and we're going to actually be able to walk into the throne room of God, you're going to walk in different then, oh, snap, so I forgot to pray. Jesus, I'm sorry, I love you, thank you, Jesus, for this food. Hope cheeseburger's good, amen. That's not how you're walking in the room. I would even say this. I said it in the first service, and I'll say it again in this service. I'm gonna give you a warning. What I'm about to make is not a political statement, so don't be foolish and make a political joke. All right? I say that in all seriousness, please. We in our country have the office of president, And it doesn't matter who sits in that office, the office of president, if it is to maintain its value, it has to be honored. Or it won't matter for anybody that has the office, regardless of where you stand on it. But I promise, there is a protocol that will take place when you go to that office. If you ever had the opportunity to go to that office, there is a protocol. You don't just get to call the guy by his first name. You don't just get to walk in and go, hey, let me show you what I got in my coat pocket. That's not gonna happen. There is a protocol that takes place. And yet we know that, we'll do that for job interviews. We'll we'll tighten it up, job interview. Got my suits a little snug. It's been a while since I wore it, but I'm gonna show up because I want this job. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my best foot forward and I get it, hold on just a second before you turn all spiritual and go, God doesn't need that stuff. I know. But are you going to talk to somebody that can fix everything in your life? If you are, You might ought to slow down, check yourself to make sure you're not just treating him like a genie. I just need an answer. Lord, help me with this. In the Old Testament, when the priest would make sacrifice, when people would bring their sacrifice to the the temple, they would bring these sacrifices in. This would have been a year's investment in the very best sheep oxen, bullock, dove, goat, whatever it was. It was the very best we had. And there would have been all day at Passover. It would have been all day long. The priests would have been cutting the throat, bleeding the animal out, skinning the animal, burning the animal in offering, and all this immense process that took place and it would have been all day and about the time you were done with one the next person was right here and they'd put that animal on the altar and walk through the entire process again but when they prayed there was a moment that's actually written in the prayer as you look it up in the Hebrew you can see it where when the priest would pray there was a moment where they would go And then they would proceed. At every sacrifice, they paused to go, this is valuable. And so I'm not going to just treat it as if it's the next prayer in line. It's valuable. I got to give it the the space that it needs. Church, prayer is valuable. You have to give it the space that it needs. You have to give it the time that it requires. You say, Vince, I don't have a lot of time. That's why he says, go into your room, shut the door, and have a moment with me. It has to be intentional. Vince, I just don't have time. You have time for NCIS. You have time for Netflix. You have time for Facebook. You have time for Instagram. You have time for all of that stuff. But the creator says, give me some time and we're busy, unless we're in trouble, then we want his time. 
It's an unfair ask, if you ask me. He says, when you pray, go into your room and close the door. I want it to be intentional. I don't want there to be a bunch of distractions. But Pastor Vince, I got kids. I just can't figure out a time without my kids. Trick them. <laughs> Put them in their high chair. Lock them down. Whatever you got to do. Make time for it. Be intentional in your prayer. Be intentional in what you say. I remember when I was little, I heard this prayer at school, and I figured I would drop some knowledge on my pastor dad. So we, he said, Vince, you want to pray for dinner tonight? I said, yes, sir. Everybody got real quiet, and I was like, good bread, good meat, good God, let's eat. Amen. <laughs> uh, and, and that may have been the nearest I've ever come to meeting Jesus Christ in my life. <laughs> you don't do that stuff when your dad's a pastor. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Uh, he did not think it was funny. And I got my world rocked. I'm not going to tell you anything beyond that because the PTSD is strong in that story. <laughs> he said, no, 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 no. That is not what we do. We don't treat God like he's the speaker at the drive through That's not who he is. He is the creator of all things. He is the God who gives the answers that our lives need when we need it. He is the protector, the provider. He is my resource and my source. We don't come to him like it's nothing, like we're just talking to whoever on the street. Hallowed be thy name. Holy and separate is this God that we serve. Is he accessible? Yes, that's the our father part. But we cannot forget the hallowed part that he is God. And we are not. And the fact that he allows us to come to him is amazing. What it took for us to come to him. See, when I pray, I, if you can picture this in your mind, and when I pray, I get to step through the veil that was torn when he died. Every time I pray, don't decrease its value because you're busy. Prayer should be intentional. So many often, he said this, don't be like the, those that heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Don't. Do not do this. That's what verse 8 says. There's not an award. Okay? It's not an award for the most spiritual, eloquent prayer. Believe me, I hear some of those people, and I'm like, man, I wish I could pray like that. You guys know who I'm talking about? Like those people? Those people? Dear God. And their whole voice changes. And you're like, oh, you hear angels. <laughs> you know, there's people that just do that. Like, I would love to hear Morgan Freeman pray. Like, this would be awesome. Or at least I think it'd be awesome. He may be a little redneck like I am. I don't know. I've had those moments where I feel like, oh, God, I'm going to put all the right words together. I, I'm going to just, boy, I'm going to pour it out. It's going to be good. God, I, read, I brought my dictionary. I'm going to use big words so that you understand because you're a big God. And then there have been moments where literally... I've been right here, and I said, I can't do this anymore. God, I have nothing. I have nothing to bring you but me. And I know I'm not enough. So, Lord, if you could, sh if you could, I need you. He says that your father who sees in secret will reward you. An award is something that's given to somebody who has excelled or reached a high level. A reward is something you get when you found something that was lost. God will reward that intimacy that you find that you may have lost. But you got to be intentional about it. 
prayer is not optional. Prayer should be intentional. The last thing is this, that prayer is 100% relational. Back in the Garden of Eden, God would walk with Adam. He would just walk with him. The Bible says that and in the cool of the evening, Adam and God would walk together. And they just talked. God had given Adam the, the role of naming creation. So God like just goes creation and makes all these animals and all this stuff. And then he looks at man and says, hey, you name them. What? You name them. I don't know how he come up with platypus duck, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and they would walk, and I can picture God going, what do you think of, what, that, what about that one that's in the, tr monkey. Really, you're going to go with monkey. Monkey, I like it. And it's stuck. What about that one over there? Elephant. Ooh, big word, big animal. I dig it, Adam, good job. And he'd walked. And it was not good that man was alone, so God put a sleep on Adam. He created something else. And then God looked at Adam and said, what do you want to name her? And he went, whoa, man. <laughs> God said, that fits. It works. Just a few chapters later, we see a man named Enoch. And the Bible says he walked with God. And one day, I think walked with God is a present tense word, meaning that he was continually walking with God. And as God would walk with Enoch in the, in the evenings like he did with Adam, and they would get to the end of the day, and Enoch would go, well, I'm going to go on home today. All right, Enoch, I'll see you tomorrow. And Enoch would go home, and God would go home, and then the next night they would walk together until one night God got to the end of the road with Enoch, and Enoch said, well, I think I'm going to go home, God. And God said, Enoch, why don't you go to my place? And the Bible said Enoch was, and then he was not, for he walked with God, and God took him. He never died. He just got to walk from this life directly into the next one. These stories over and over of God just wanting to be with you. He just wants to be with you. He just wants your time. He just wants, he wants, the, he wants all the stuff to sit outside the door. That's why he said, close the door. Go into the room and close the door. Get in the room and close the door. But God, I got so much stuff going on outside the door. I know that's why I need you in the room. Shut the door. And let me just walk with you through that stuff. Let me show you how to walk through. And my challenge typically would be somewhat invitational in that if you right now haven't been intentional about your prayer, if you right now have been making prayer an option, then I want you to come forward and I want you to give that to God. And I would do an invitation much like that. Today I'm not. You see, because I don't think the invitation is here up front as much as I think it's outside at those tables where you sign up for life groups. Because just much like I said about Adam, where the Bible says that it was not good for man to walk alone, God created a helpmate for him so he would not walk alone. I think life groups are that important. I think that you and I cannot be all the believer, all the Christian, all the warrior that God needs us to be if we don't have other people in our life picking us up, dusting us off and going, hey, you got tomorrow. I know today was rough. I know it was heavy. And we make that optional because we're busy. Pastor Vince has just got so much going on. I know. I know. Me too. But I also know that in all the other things that I do, the only reason I do those other things is because I make time. I'm given the same 24 hours that you are. I, I'm given the same 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. I'm given the same time, and you're given the same time as the person next to you, and we do our best to cram everything we possibly can in that time. We're amazing at it to a fault.
Any workaholics in the house? Yeah, nobody wants to admit it. It's just real. Got so much going on, Pastor Vince. For your sake, for the sake of your family. Today, instead of coming forward, if you felt God is challenging you on prayer, go sign up for a life group where you spend the next little bit of time learning about how to do it right. Not that you should or shouldn't, that's not optional, but how to do it right. How to come to your Father who is holy and separate. How to come to Him with confession. How to come to Him with worship. How to come to Him with thanksgiving. How to come with Him with your petitions and your needs in your life. That is what we should be doing as believers. Because here's what I believe. I believe that our community, you guys have heard me say it, that I don't want to be a church in this community. In fact, I'll say it even more emphatically. I refuse to pastor a church that doesn't change the community it's in. If the hospital calls or has a need, I want them to call Real Life Church. If the school calls and has a need, I want them to call Real Life Church. If your family is broken and falling apart, I want you to call Real Life Church. That's the only way that we're going to actually affect radical change in our community. We cannot do it on Sundays alone no matter how great our worship is no matter how good a sermon God gives me to preach it won't work unless it's you that changes the community with one another it won't so whatever excuse you've come up with let me be direct and as loving as I can it's not good enough. I don't, want the, I don't want the language that I speak with God. To be excuse. I don't want that. I don't want that for me. I don't want that for you. Don't let another option get in the way of you drawing close to the Father. Now, when we close, and I'm about to pray to close, we have communion available. Every point that I just gave you about prayer and the worship act of praying, these same points line up with communion and these tables that are before you. giving God thanks and gratitude for the sacrifice he made, which is what communion is. And when you do this, remember me. It's not optional. As a believer, we should be doing this. As a believer, you should be partaking. You also should be making sure that it's intentional, that you just don't walk up, grab the cup, throw it back. No, 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 no. This is bigger than that. Vince, it's, it's, it's bread and some grape juice. It's not that big a deal. Corinthians says it this way. This is why, because there are some sick among you and even dead, because they have taken the Lord's body in an unworthy fashion. It was flippant. It didn't mean anything. No, this is serious. This is you and God coming together and doing this in remembrance of that cross outside Jerusalem. So when you take this, make sure you're intentional. But understand that the root of it, it's all relational. It is God saying, take this cup, which is my blood, that was spilled for you. Take this body, which is, this bread, which is my body, which was broken on your behalf. This is all God being the first person in the relationship to put himself out there and go, I've given everything for you. Will you return the favor? Because all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? So the way I see it today, you got two options when you leave. When I say amen here in just a moment, you can walk forward and you can partake in communion or you can walk out and sign up to partake in life groups. Don't find the middle and end up missing what God has for you.